today what I will be talking about. I will mention like uh, this presentation is split into the three main areas. Uh, first I will talk some very basic principles of uh, Open co uh, ID Connect. Uh, it's quite a big thing so I will cover just the basic but it should be enough to get you going. I will mention why we need it, uh, why, why do we need uh, something like Open ID Connect in today's world. I will show a very simple demo with uh, Google. And then the second and third part of the presentation, I will show two recommended flow, uh, which should cover most of your scenarios. And I will show them like a first demo, I will show with a single page application. It will be just a simple plain JavaScript, no framework and API will be in ASP.NET Core and as an identity provider we use the identity server. I will say also some few things about the identity server. And uh, the last uh, part of the presentation is about uh, client credential grants. That's for machine to machine scenario and it's um, uh, it will be API to API in ASP.NET and Core and again with the identity server. And um, yeah, it's a bit longer than one hour, so please feel free to leave about any other section if you're not interested anymore, because uh, to go through that demo, it uh, I cannot do it uh, within one hour. So I think like all three sections, each section is roughly half an hour. Uh, to guide you through the uh, protocol of OpenID Connect, I prepared a demo. This demo should, uh, you know, cover the most of the scenarios you can meet in your life when you're doing. And th sorry, this is like one important thing is that all these components uh, of the solution are running on internet. So it's not uh, you cannot use the uh, like advantages when you're running the solution on the internet network. But uh, imagine that this is running like all these components are distributed applications on the internet. So in our scenario, we will have a single page uh, client application. We will have a MVC client application. And there is quite a big difference between single page and MVC because single page application runs completely on user browser. So any malicious uh, hacker can do anything with your application. So in terms of security, it's much harder to secure a single page application. Uh, then another type of the application, it's a classical web application which has a which use the full postbacks. So in our case, that will be ASP.NET Core MEC. But uh, with this type of application, you have a bit of advantage because part of your code is running on the server and you can secure the server. And then you would have uh, APIs, like first API would be called by the client application. And the second API, imagine it's some external API which is needed by the first API. And uh, it will be classical machine to machine scenario. So with this uh, demo sample, I can cover most of the needs you have. Single page application is actually also like a mobile application. It has roughly the same security constraints. So uh, if we don't know anything about the IP ID uh, Connect or if, we if Open ID Connect doesn't exist, how would you secure this scenario in past? Like, you know, in past uh, MVC client application, we could use the form-based uh, security. So it means this application had uh, its own database of users. It uh, stored the users, it stored the passwords, and used the cookie and uh, forms to perform the authentication. With the API, uh, again, if you were on the uh, internet, you couldn't use the internal security of the closed network. Uh, you would use typically basic authentication, like s that means that you would send username, password with every request and uh, API would have to probably, will need some internal database with these uh, username passwords to check that you authorize to run it. So, and with single page application, I even don't know, I don't develop single page applications, so I don't know how these were secure in past. Any other idea how to secure it without OpenID Connect? There were like some Windows Communication Foundation standards which try to cover it, but that standard is pretty much dead because you have these days, you have uh, web APIs. So how would you secure this 
scenario on public. No, well, I don't know anything else than what I said. <laughs> so if you don't know anything else, so uh, clearly uh, these historical means are not a really good one, right? Yeah, first, you have to uh, take care of many things straight in your application. And second, like even if you take care of this, the solution is not really ideal. It's not very good to send username password with every request, for example. So um, how to sort this out? And I was thinking, and when I was learning it as well, I was thinking, uh, like in many things in software, you can actually think about some uh, real-life example and you can find quite good parallel how it's sorted out in the real world and that will help you to understand why OpenID Connect work as it works. So I actually was thinking about some real-time examples and uh, to, to get inspiration and uh, one example was when you go to bank to create, you want to open account in the bank. So the bank needs to know who you are. The, the bank needs to authenticate you, right? And uh, now the bank uh, doesn't have database of all the people in the country, doesn't have access to birth certificates or, you know, fingerprints or anything. They, they, they don't have it and they cannot really authenticate who you are using their own means. So what they do? They actually get all the information from your national ID card, right? They uh, don't need anything else because they just need to know who you are and this information is on your ID card. But uh, in order this to work, there must be some condition met. Like first, like the bank must trust uh, the organization which issued the ID card, right? So that's uh, the the bank obviously trusts the Czech um, public services, which issues the Czech national ID card, that for them it's a trustworthy issuer, so they trust it. And uh, the issuer actually have to make sure that uh, the ID card is protected against tampering. So, you know, if you get some ID card, you can produce your own, or you can easily change the existing one. So, that's one situation when the when we need to know the authentication in real life. Now imagine another situation, like you're going to rock concert or any concert, and uh, this is slightly different because uh, again, like you know, at the security uh, in the gate there will be security guys and they they just interested if you paid, and uh, maybe you know if it's a concert which has a different sectors and you pay for different sectors, they interest it uh, for which sector you pay. They don't care who you are. They just interest it if you authorize to enter, if you paid and for which sector. So they can actually do the same thing. They, they, they don't have their own database of all people and they don't try to find in the database if you paid or not. They just happy if you show them the ticket, right? And uh, they get all the information from the ticket, which sector you can you 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 allow to go and again it's the same thing like uh, the the security guys they trust the ticket issuer and the ticket issuer actually doesn't have to be uh, organizers of the concert it can be some external agency like ticket stream uh, so just important thing is that uh, the security guy know how the tickets looks like they trust the organization which issued the ticket and uh, the ticket is protected against the tempering, so it's not easy to produce your own ticket and go to the concert or, you know, pay for the cheapest ticket and then change the sector and go to the most expensive one. So this parallel we can actually use in the software as well. So you can actually delegate the authentication to external entity, to external component, uh, which is called the identity provider in OpenID Connect. And uh, the user deals, in terms of authentication, the user deals with the uh, identity provider. And when the user authenticates, the identity provider will send to your application, it will send to uh, not ID card, but something called ID token. But it's complete parallel. The ID token contains the information about the user, which you need to know. And uh, the same like in the real world, uh, we must make sure that uh, it's not easy to 
or it's not possible to create the ID token on your own, or if you get the ID co token, it's not possible to, to, you know, to change the information on that ID token. So when we go through the standard, the standard must make sure that these things are fulfilled. And in parallel with the uh, concert, going to the concert, it's like uh, you wanna use some API and uh, typically the API is not interested who you are, they're not interested in authentication, they're interested in authorization. So they just want to know that uh, you are authorized to access this API, which doesn't necessarily mean they need to know who you are. And uh, in uh, OpenID Connect, uh, this is called access token. So ID token is for the authentication, access token is for authorization. Yeah, and the same thing I do for the another client application as well. The the authentication is delegated to identity provider and get the token. And uh, yeah, you see already the advantages that uh, one big advantage is that your application don't have to take care of implementing users and passwords, which is normally quite hard, and you delegate it to specialized component, which can be your own or you can use the external provider. Right. Uh, one important thing, of course, is, and it's the same like in the real world, if someone steals the token, uh, they, can, they can get the access to the service. And it's the same like, you know, if someone steals your ticket when you go to a concert, he can go to the concert. And the same applies here. So what you have to do is you have to protect uh, the tokens from being stolen, and this is uh, using SSL HTTPS. That's, that's how it must be done, and it's actually mandatory to use HTTPS when you use the tokens, unless you are on some internal network, but on internal network you wouldn't need the tokens probably. So uh, that was briefly uh, how the OpenID Connect and uh, how the OpenID Connect operates and uh, what's the behind, I well what's the idea behind it. Uh, one thing, I was not very <laughs> exact in uh, uh, name of the standards here. Here I'm talking about uh, OpenID Connect, but there are actually two standards. One is called uh, OAuth 2, and OAuth 2 was uh, the first one, but OAuth 2 is basically uh, only about the authorization, it's only about access tokens. And it's an open standard for the access delegation, it's designed for HTTP, you know, for today's web API world. But uh, it was only about uh, access tokens and about getting access to the APIs. And uh, that was the first standard. And it did does didn't say how uh, authentication happened. So that's why some guys came with the uh, OpenID Connect, which is actually like a layer on top of OAuth 2. And it adds this missing bit, which is authentication. And uh, it adds the uh, identity token notion. Uh, in uh, you know, in, in today's presentation, I will I will just go I will just be simple and call everything OpenID Connect. Uh, sometimes I would mean OAuth 2, but I think for practical reasons, it's uh, not really necessary to know what is the difference between these two. So, uh, you know, just to be you just need to be aware that it's actually two standards. Uh, before I say something about the standards, just quick terminology because we will use this terminology throughout the presentation. So the identity provider, I already mentioned uh, what identity provider is. It's an external component which implements the authentication and which issues the tokens. It implements OpenID Connect and OAuth 2. And the uh, ID token, access token, I explain. That's actually the terminology from OpenID Connect as well. Uh, the applications which are facing the users, uh, they called clients in the terminology. And uh, the APIs which you need to protect, they called in uh, these standards, they called a resource server. Uh, meaning is that the API contains some resources which they serve to incoming requests, but they need authorization. They must be sure that you authorize or the application which tries to use the resources, is authorized to use these resources. So just before I uh, tell m a bit more about uh, OpenID Connect, I actually show a very simple example of uh, Google. Uh, most of the 
big uh, companies like Google, Microsoft, Twitter, they actually use OpenID Connect for their own means. So when you want to, for example, when you want to access the Google Docs as an external application, you do it through OpenID Connect. So uh, this is the scenario specialized for Google. Identity provider here is uh, Google Accounts. Uh, I have some imaginary my SPA application, my single page application, and I want to access uh, Google Docs. And Google Docs obviously doesn't want to serve the documents to everyone. Uh, they ask for the access token and uh, they authorize your access based on the access token. Uh, so now the first demo, uh, most of the uh, authentication or pretty much every authentication uh, involving user starts with a redirect to authentication platform to IDP provider. And uh, the standards will actually tell you uh, how the different steps of getting the code contents looks like. And this is the first step. This is uh, how you compose your authenticate, uh, your authorized, uh, sorry, your redirect link to uh, get redirected to the Google uh, to get a token. Uh, what are the parts of this? I will tell you something about these parts because that will give you idea how the standard works. Like first thing you have to supply is uh, client ID. Uh, client ID is a unique identification of your client application. Uh, it always works in the way when you use the external provider that first you have to register your application with that external provider. So I have to go, when I want to use the Google, I have to go to Google portal and say I'm application developer and I register my application. I give Google uh, my application name and the Google uh, generates a couple of things for me. One is them, one of them is client ID. This is unique identification of my application. Then I need to tell Google in uh, my redirect where I want to be redirected back after I get authenticated with the Google. And uh, in uh, response type, I will say what type of the flow I want to use. I will get to this later, but Open ID Connect has a few flows. Every flow is suitable for different scenario. I will explain later. And in scope, I will also say what type of the information I ask back. And here I'm saying I want, uh, I'm using open ID. And that just means that I always get the ID of the user, subject ID back. But on top of it, I also want the uh, user's email and I want the user's profile. And by profile, uh, the standard means the personal information like uh, first name, second name, your picture, or whatever uh, the provider has about you. And the state announce, it's not important, it's uh, about this flow, but I will not go into the detail of this flow because I will show you the flows which are recommended these days. So uh, I will actually show you what happened when I use this link. I will let me just uh, copy that link to the browser. So you see I get redirected to the Google, to the sign-in page. And here, because uh, Google knows about my application, it already, displayed, it already displays to the user what kind of application he's providing the credentials for. So you know, the user knows that uh, this is the application which is asking for the access. So I fill my credentials, my password, Sorry. <laughs> well, it's a demo account, so you wouldn't get anything with that. And I got redirected back to that URI I supplied. There is nothing running. I have no application running here, so that's why it shows the site can't be reached, because that local host I supplied as a redirect URI, there is nothing running. But for this demo, it's not important, because what's important, what I wanted to show you, is uh, what I get back. Let's see what I got back in that redirect link. I get back a 
some stuff, but most important stuff is I get back something which is called uh, ID token in that URL. Let me uh, just find where it finish. I think it finish here. So I get a couple of uh, things in uh, redirect uh, in uh, in query string, but this is the important things. This is the ID token, and this is that ID card like the Opchanka. Yeah, this is what what contains the information about the user, and the format here is uh, JSON Web Token. JSON Web Token is a standard which uh, is uh, independent of OpenID Connect, but OpenID Connect use it uses it for some situation, like for ID token, it always uses the JSON Web Token. And uh, JSON Web Token is actually JSON, which has uh, three parts. It has a header, it has uh, information itself, and it has a signature. And, uh, you know, it's a JSON, and you remove the white spaces, then all the characters you translate to U UTF uh, byte array, and then you encode base64 uh, that byte array, and you get this token. So it's not encryption, it's this is the open. So I can actually take this, and I can look what it what's inside the token. Oh, sorry, thanks, yeah. Uh, so I can actually go to to the s to the uh, JSON Web uh, Token site, which is called like this. It provides you uh, a lot of uh, documentation about the JSON Web Tokens. It actually provides quite a good book, which tells you all the details you know about the JSON Web Token. And one thing which also provides is this debugger. I can copy my to my token here. And uh, I will get displayed what's inside the token. And you see on the left side, it's it uh, colored the three different parts I told you about. First part is header. It's just saying, oh, I'm JSON W token. And uh, this bit, uh, this RS256, it says I'm using the, the uh, asymmetrical signature. I will explain later. And uh, this is actually uh, the the payload, what's inside. This is what Google tells me about my identity. So you can see here that uh, subject, that's the unique ID of the user. This is what I get because I ask for open ID profile, uh, sorry, scope. And this is the profile information. I get the, sorry, email, inform email uh, scope. And this is the profile scope. I get the name, picture, given name, family name, what's my language. I also get the expiry of the J JSON Web Token. Typically, uh, JSON Web Token has a limited lifetime. And... Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, yes, some of the... A uh, lot of fields are standardized, and you can add your own. Uh, most of them, which you see here, are actually from the standard. So in standard, you get, uh, I think, almost all of them. Maybe given name, family name is uh, custom, but and picture, but everything else is in the standard. Uh, you remember I told you that uh, you 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 must make sure that uh, the user cannot change the token. So to, to protect the token from change, this payload is actually signed, and the signature is the last bit of this. And uh, it's signed in this case. It's signed by uh, asymmetrical encryption by private public key. It means that uh, the, uh, the Google signs the payload by its private key, and you can use Google public key to verify the signature. So that's by by this way, no one like you know. If you uh, take this token, you modify to be someone else, it wouldn't work because the application uh, will verify your token and will find out that the signature doesn't match. So that was the Google example. Obviously, now like you know, if if I continue with this flow. Uh, 
uh, I would use the inf I, I would verify the signature and I would use the the information from the token to do whatever I need in mi in my single page application. But for this demo, it's uh, it's enough. I will return to the presentation. Uh, I will just go back to our scenario because I told you that I want to detail like two major flows in OpenID Connect we can use to secure this scenario. So what I actually done, like I prepared um, uh, ASP.NET Core solution or .NET Core solution for this. Uh, d I prepared the demo application which, which has these components. I will just quickly show you the demo application which we can walk through. Uh, it's an application which has, uh, I don't know, I hope you can see it. It has two APIs, like on the picture. It has a single page uh, client and it has a MEC client. And uh, they talk exactly in that way as in a diagram. So when I run the application, it will run four components. Now nothing is protected, now everything is open. And in my presentation, I'll show you how to secure this application. So this is the single page application. Uh, if I click this button, it will call API 1 and gets the information back. If I call this, if I click the second button, it will call API 1 and API 1 will call API 2. So you get the uh, information from API 2 and API 1. It's just completely fabricated example, but it shows you the uh, what was on the picture. And now everything is open. Anyone can go to this application and it can one call API. And what we want to do, we, we want to secure this stuff. We'll switch it off for now. Back to the... So, actually... Uh, the Open ID Connect and all out two uh, is all about the steps you have to implement to communicate with your identity provider and to get the tokens back. And for depending on type of the application, it gives you different flows. In Open ID Connect, it's called flow. In all out two, it's called grant. I would use flow, but uh, you know, just when you see just pure all out standard, you probably see the, the grant, but don't be confused there. So uh, there are uh, these types of the grants and these types of the flows in the standard. And if you go to the standard, it will tell you if you use the authorization code grant, you use this um, link, you connect to your, this that redirect link has these uh, options use these options and then you get back the token and then you have to do these things with the token and depending on the application the steps are slightly different uh, as I mentioned these flows are different for uh, different application type and originally until the end of the last year these were the recommendation for different type of the application the recommendation was for single page application used something called implicit flow for a server-based uh, web application, it doesn't have to be MEC or you know just for the web apps, use this type of flow for mobile apps. This one for machine to machine. This one that was up up to last year. Uh, you will still see it in uh, many websites because uh, you know that was recommended uh, until quite recently. But now these days, uh, they they actually improve one of these flows called authorization code. They extended it with something they called uh, Pixie, which is proof key code for exchange. And uh, the, the authors or OpenID Connect uh, now saying you can use this flow for all this type of uh, user facing applications. So, so you can use this single flow for single page application web apps and mobile apps as well. And for machine to machine, uh, the recommendation is same as, as in past, use the client credential grant. So in uh, my uh, next part of the presentation, I'll show you how you can implement these flows. Any question to is, this is the end of the first section.
Well, actually, I will show you in uh, on on this uh, authorization code. It's a bit more complex. In a few minutes, I'll show you the steps, what you have to do. But you're right, you will not get everything in the first redirect. You have to ask for more information. That's the part of the flow I show you in a couple of minutes. Was that the question? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, OK. Uh, you know, as an identity server, I used Google in the first demo. In uh, this demo, I will use the something which is called Identity Server 4. It's it's an identity provider uh, which you can use in your if you want to you, you can implement your own identity provider. Identity Server is uh, NuGet, and you can use this NuGet either to extend your existing project to make uh, Open ID Connect provider with it, or you can create a completely new project. You can use the templates which are part of the uh, part of which are on the Git as well, and. Uh, you can create your own identity provider. And that identity provider, it's an ASP.NET Core uh, application, and you can use uh, different parts, and you can configure it in different way. It's very customizable. But uh, you know, if you don't want to use, for some reason, external provider like uh, Google or uh, Microsoft Azure, you, you need to do something special. Uh, for example, you have already your own users or you have your database you can use the identity server so identity server it's a, it's a, it's a nuget which you add to your project or you create a new one uh, it's a open source it's certified by open id foundation open id foundation are the guys who are behind the open id connect and uh, they have a certification process to make sure that if someone claims they implement open id connect they make sure that it's true that, that they certify them. Uh, Identity Server is also part of uh, .NET Foundation, you know, which is organization uh, which promotes uh, open source in .NET. And the uh, important thing is it's Apache 2 license, so you can use Identity Server for your commercial uh, needs. It's no problem with that using it on, on a commercial project. And I will use this identity server, I will show you uh, as an identity provider. So uh, now uh, to the first flow, which I want to show you, which will cover pretty much all your uh, application which are facing the user. And it's called other authorization code flow with proof key for code exchange. Uh, if you look into the standard, you can you can read about it from the standard, but it's quite um, it's not very easy to read, but it's uh, the ultimate uh, source of the truth, right? But you can also use um, I give you another link here, which is actually uh, for software called Okta. Okta is some kind of software which is identity provider as a service. You can use it. I don't use Okta, but they have a very good documentation for the flows. And that's actually a good tip. Like, uh, you know, these providers, you, can, you don't have to use uh, their product, but they will describe the Open ID Connect, which is a standard, so you can use it, the knowledge anywhere else. They can provide much better uh, documentation or learning resources than the standard itself. And uh, now on this diagram, you can see what's happening during the uh, during the authorization code flow with Pixie. It's a bit complex. I don't want to go through the details. You don't know. You don't need to know the details. You have a um, you have the link in uh, the presentation, and it's not important to know all the details at this point. But basically, it works in the way that. Um, uh, it makes getting the tokens more secure than what you see with the Google. You know what you see with the Google? I just uh, redirect to the Google and back I get the token in a redirect URL. But actually that's not a very secure way how you get back the tokens because uh, URL is typically recorded in different network components, in log files. 
It's also part of the browsing history. So if you have a browser with some extensions which can look into your history, they can get hold of your tokens. So that flow is not very safe actually because uh, the tokens are passed in uh, uh, redirect. So uh, they recommend they don't recommend this flow anymore, and they recommend this one without it. And in short, basically, uh, this flow uh, the idea is that uh, you do the redirect as before, but instead of getting tokens back, you get uh, you get a code, unique code back, and then in independent AJAX call you exchange that code uh, with identity provider for the tokens. And on top of it, uh, there is uh, this additional uh, authentication using this uh, proof key. Uh, it's not important to go through the details. If you know how the steps exactly are, I just recommend reading this. I'll show you how to implement it without even knowing all these details. So, uh, that will be my second presentation. Uh, I will switch to my sample, my demo sample. And uh, what I want to do actually, I want to, uh, this, is, this is my very advanced single page application. <laughs> this is the complete application. And now it's not protected at all. Uh, so, uh, you know, When I run it, I don't know who 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 is the user because there is no authentication. So now in this single page application, I want to use the identity server to do authentication for me. I have an identity server here as well. And uh, you can see it's just a simple ASP.NET Core project. And uh, I got a flavor which actually has some uh, test users inside. But you can get different flavors of identity server depending on what template you use. You can get the completely new one and implement your own UI, or you might use the identity server just for machine to machine. In this case, you wouldn't have any UI. It you would have just some registration for the, for the client ID and client credentials. So at the moment, my identity server is completely empty. It just have two test users, but it's not ready to receive any authentication request. You, you remember at the beginning I mentioned that typically when you want to use some identity provider, you have to go and you have to register with that identity provider. So you have to do the same here. In order my uh, single page application to use this identity server, I have to register it. The identity server must know about it. Uh, in a simple development scenario, you can use just uh, overload of these functions or define these functions to do it, but it's a flexible system. You can have your uh, registration in database or whatever. You don't need to have them in the code or you can have them in JSON. I will just uh, choose the, 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 the simplest scenario when I define my clients in the code. So first thing I have to do is um, I have to define my single page client I want to use. I will just quickly stop here and explain what's happening. Like now I'm telling the identity server uh, to be uh, ready to accept the authentication request from client which is called SPA client. I assign it with this ID and uh, this guy is allowed to talk to me with uh, using authorization code with uh, Pixie. And uh, these are the redirect URIs the client is allowed to ask. Maybe you get confused why I have to uh, tell which URIs are, why I have to specify them here as well because you know, as a client, I'm already sending them in an uh, authentication request. But this is another layer of the security. It just like, uh, uh, it means that uh, like uh, some different client would not be able to ask for authentication and be redirected somewhere else than it's registered here. So imagine it's just like extra security. And uh, the same is for uh, uh, logout. I will implement the logout as well. 
And uh, because I'm using the single page application, I have to configure uh, cores on the server. And uh, another thing, I tell during the registration what scopes uh, the client application is allowed to ask for. So in our example, I will allow the application to ask for uh, ID user. So th this is this open ID scope and profile. I will give away whatever I have from the profile. So I configured my client. Sorry, I uh, configured my identity server. extra I will run it my identity server is running and now I ha want to go uh, to my single page application and I want to implement uh, this type of the flow we've seen in uh, here. I don't want to do this in JavaScript, <laughs> like to implement something like this. Unfortunately, I don't have to do that. There is a lot of libraries you can use. And uh, because it's a standard, so someone done the job for you. So for uh, JavaScript clients, uh, the most commonly used, uh, li uh, there is already some library which is developed and the most commonly used is called OEDC client and I will use this one, I show you how to use it and I don't have to worry about this flow, the library will implement the flow for me. Mm -hmm. uh, now we redirect is from the resource owner to the client application, so... Yeah, well, it's sorry, it's a bit confusing, resource owner is the user. But the authorization server has no say in how the error happens because it's not the authorization server who does the reaction, it's the resource owner itself. So ah. Well it's yeah, it's, 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 it's the doing it. Yeah, it's exactly the yeah, yeah, it's exactly the same what I shown you with the Google. The stat is the same. Just uh, what what differs is that when you get the redirect back, you don't get the tokens, you get the you get the, you get the code back. And then you have to do some extra stuff with this code to get the tokens. And on top of it, uh, there is this uh, proof key flow, which is these uh, other yellow guys. But actually, if I use that library, I, I don't have to worry about that because library will implement it for me. Uh, Yeah, that library is the called uh, uh, OIDC client, if you can see that. So I will just add it to my application using libman, which is uh, some stuff to get uh, JavaScript libraries. And uh, I will modify a bit of my page. I just need to add uh, login buttons. And I include the script into my page. And I need to modify the JavaScript as well, right? So when I go to my JavaScript, I will not type it, I will just copy it, but I explain what happened here. I just added handlers for this login and logout button, but I don't implement uh, that flow, I will use the library. And the uh, idea behind the library is that you call something which is, you, you call an object which is called the user manager, and during the initialization of the application, you will tell the object, the parameters, you need to communicate with identity provider, right? And uh, these parameters are uh, URL to that identity provider. My identity server is running on port 5000. I have to identify myself. This is the client ID I was assigned during my registration. I want to redirect back uh, to this. This is uh, where I'm running. And the logout will be redirected here as well. 
remember that uh, this must match the URL which you put into the registration, another security layer. I'm saying here that I want to use the authorization code, flow, and I'm asking for open ID and full profile. And uh, if uh, identity provider is configured in the way that it allows what I want here, it will let me through. So, um, let's run it and see. So now, uh, yeah, and I forgot to say one important thing. After I uh, configure my user manager, uh, I just uh, hang my buttons on methods of that user manager. And that user manager has a method for login, for logout, and for getting the tokens. That's what you need. So you're not involved in the flow. You declaratively say where you want to connect, and then use the method on the user management to implement login, logout, and whatever you need and you don't care about the, the rest. Yeah, okay, so when I call again, you see I'm redirected to, to identity server, and uh <coughs> I was already logged, uh, sorry. Uh, I will log out because I you wouldn't see what, what was happening. No, I played with it before and I log in already, so you wouldn't see what's happening. So okay, so I will get out now. I will restart it. Oh, not this one, sorry. Yeah, now you see I'm I'm uh, redirected to identity provider, which is identity server. I told you that it was configured with some test users, so I will use the test user. I will log in and uh, I will get uh, what I've done in my application is that I just display uh, what I get back from that user manager. So what user manager done was actually it implemented all the flows which you seen in the diagram and it get back uh, ID token for me, access token for me and this is the decoded information from the token. If you want to actually see what was happening, let's try again. And uh, I will just open the console. Show the network. I do log in. Look, the, the first thing what happened was that uh, my single page application or actually that library contacted the identity server and asked for something called open id configuration and our open id configuration is actually when i get this It's actually JSON, which is exposed by identity provider. This is standard. So if I put this address to Google or Measure or uh, Microsoft Azure or whatever, uh, it will display this document as well. And it just provides the information about the identity provider in terms of uh, where are different uh, endpoints on that identity provider and what identity provider supplies in terms of what, what flows it uh, it. Uh implements. So when I, uh, in my single page application, when I specify the authority here, what the library did is it contacted the open ID configuration to get all the URLs it will need for the implement all the flow. So when I come back here and I will continue You will see that in uh, 
you know, in the back scene, uh, some other calls were happening. And you can see that I, you know, after I get the configuration, the library actually asked for uh, did uh, like a different things. It contacted like a different look, like you know, it contacted this uh, endpoint uh, to get this token, and they uh, then did some another calls. And basically, these calls I will not go through the details, but these calls is actually the implementation of what you've seen on the picture. So that was done by by the library for you, so you don't have to implement this. So, uh, you know, at the moment, what I've done is I implemented the, and I go back to my presentation. I implemented this part, yeah. I uh, have a single page application and I use the identity server to get the ID token back. Now the second part I want to do is I want to get the access token as well and I want to use this access token to access the API so this will be because now when I the, the API one I, I only know who the user is but the API one is still not uh, protected anyone can call it So let's protect uh, the API too, so no one can call it. You know this, I put the uh, authorize here. And uh, so now like uh, only authorized requests get through, but obviously I have to configure uh, the application in startup, I have to say what type of authorization I'm using. Again, like you can, because it's a standard, you can go and you can read the standard and you can implement uh, using the stand using the steps in the standard. You can implement uh, all the things you have to do in authorization when you get the token, or you will use the external library. And in my case, I will use the external library again. I don't want to implement it myself. And I did a mistake here. I wanted to secure this guy, actually. So let's secure it. And uh, OpenID Connect to or actually uh, to protect your API, you use the JSON web tokens, which were issued by OpenID Connect provider. And to use the JSON web tokens, you can use a generic package implemented by Microsoft, which is called the JSON WT bear. And uh, it would actually work with a token issued by anyone. It doesn't have to be OpenID Connect provider if you create your own token, you can use this software as well. But uh, if you use the OpenID Connect and you, you use the provider, you can use this package to implement full flow for using the token as well. So uh, now I have to configure the startup as well. So first thing I have to do is uh, I have to configure uh, this um, I have to configure this provider and here I'm again I'm saying look I'm using uh, JSON uh, web tokens which are issued by this guy and this guy is identity server. And I need to do, I need to, when I use the authorized attribute, I ov obviously have to, uh, I have to uh, add ad use authentication and use authorization to my uh, pipeline as well. I didn't have it before, but with authorized attribute, you have to add these components there. 
an important date you you should not uh, forgot is uh, because it was single page application and I had to configure cores if I use the bear token I have to configure cores not just for uh, the URL but I also have to tell allow any header meaning that uh, the cores work uh, with the clients sending any 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 header because it will use the tokens otherwise that wouldn't work and the cores the browser would reject the the request if you do if you don't do this and uh, now I can try to run it let me set this up I will just run I will run um, client single page and I will run API one let's run it You can see that uh, I cannot call my API directly anymore. I get the 401, so it's protected, right? So this is the URL, direct URL to my uh, API doesn't work anymore unless I send the token. And uh, let's try, uh, if oh, sorry, and one important thing I forgot is, um, I have to obviously uh, use the token in my single page application to access the API. I haven't done this yet. So I will go to my single page application. I will find where I am calling that external API. That external API is called here. And I will just change it that uh, when I call uh, get on that application I will also add the uh, authorization header and I supply the access token and the access token I got from that user manager JavaScript library so let's log in I got the token back. Now I want to call API, and I got some type of. I got uh, I got 401. Why did I get 401? I included the access token. Sometimes when you play with the identity server, and you think it should work and it doesn't work, what is very useful is you can look into the identity uh, server console, which is this one and it will normally tell you what's wrong why why it didn't work so let's see what identity server why it rejected our call here you see what was happening like uh, me as a client i was asking for open id configuration uh, I should have an error here. Why do I not, uh, why don't I have an error here? Let's look into my Oh, actually it's uh, sorry. I made a mistake. It will be uh I will find what's wrong in my API. Uh, it's not just identity server which will give you a lot of errors but uh, if something happened but it also uh, the provider in api if something goes wrong you can look into the log file and see if something went wrong so i can see here that uh, when i try to when the token arrives and my uh, jwt handler try to verify the token it didn't like it and there is reason here why it didn't like it and uh, it's saying here that it didn't like the audience which was in the token and I would like to just give a few explanation here uh, when your API 
gets the token by OpenID Connect standard, it uh, must do some verification on the token. By default, it, verifi it verifies a couple of things. First, it verifies if uh, the token didn't expire. This is not our case. The second thing which verifies and which is mandatory is the signature. So, like, you know, the token was not modified, by the way, or malicious user didn't change it. And the, the third thing which uh, the middleware uh, checks is something called audience. And, you know, this guy is telling me that I have a wrong audience. And uh, audience basically means that uh, inside the token, you have the information for which this token is intended. So I have to say, in uh, I, the provider have to give me the token, which is just for my application, and I cannot use some other application to get the token, and then go back to another application and use it. Yeah. So for this, uh, you have to verify that the token is actually for that application which is supposed to be. So uh, to to get this working, what I have to do is. I have to go to my identity provider. And uh, the identity provider has a notion of something called API resources. And API resources uh, is uh, also that audience I will need in my token. And, uh, sorry. Now, I will add, uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying here is that uh, uh, there is an API called API1, and uh, it's a resource I want to protect. So the identity server knows that it must protect this API. Next thing I have to do is... Um, I have to tell in client registration that uh, uh, the client is uh, is uh, entitled to ask for resource. So do you understand this notion? Like identity server is now telling, look, uh, I protect API one. I list it in here, and the client called with client ID SPA is allowed to ask for that resource. So I configured the identity server. I will run it. I will go um, now to API startup again. This is the configuration of uh, token verification. I will specify, sorry, I have to, that's a bit uh, more complex. token validation and I have to specify so now uh, my uh, API uh, authentication or authorization configuration is saying when the token arrives please check that it has API 1 in the token so I configured identity server, I configured uh, API one, and now the last things I have to actually I have to do is I have to go to my uh, single page application. To the configuration here. 
and I have to ask for the scope. So now what will be happening is when I connect to uh, identity provider for my single page, I will tell identity provider, I want to authenticate and I want to get access token for API one. And uh, identity provider knows that I'm entitled to get access for that, so it will issue token with IPA1 in audience. And when the token arrives in uh, API1 server, it will find that in the token and it will let me in. So when I run now everything, I think my API one is on. Okay. Let's start it again. Okay, it was not switch off. So let's try again, third time. Okay, it looks like it's up and running. I will log in. Interesting thing what you can see here now uh, the identity provider is telling me or it's telling the user look you know the application which you're using is asking for your user identifier for your profile and it also asking for the access to this API so user knows that's another another layer of the protection as a user I have to allow that I will get the token now if I decrypt or you know if I translate this token into human readable form I will actually find out that in the token I have API 1 uh, permission and when I call it now I should succeed and I didn't succeed why didn't I succeed because I'm not running okay Or the API one is not running. No, it's not running. Let's start it separately. Why is it not running? Okay. Okay. Again, login. Yep, and I could call the API successfully now with the token. So uh, when I get to the presentation, now we are in this stage that we secured the SPA clients, get the ID token, can find out all the information about the user. Uh, and uh, it can, uh, it will get the access token and we protect the API with that access token. So that was uh, the second block of the presentation and the last block, which should be the shorter one, uh, but if you're not interested, I, you know, you can leave. It's about how to secure the API to API with the client credentials flow. Uh, this is slightly different scenario uh with the uh, machine to machine you don't have any user and the uh, machine to machine is a secure scenario like machine to machine machine is uh, able to keep the secret because it's a server component it's not like a browser application where you cannot have any secrets in browser application because malicious user can see that so in machine to machine uh, you can use something which is called client credentials grant it's very simple flow Basically, uh, you register your uh, application 
data which is in this type in this case it's API one you register with identity provider and the identity provider issues uh, client credentials for you and the client credentials are your client ID and secret and uh, when you want to access API 2 you ask identity provider for the access token you supply your client credentials identity provider give you the access token and then you use the access token to uh, connect to API 2 So let's show this demo. I will close all these. We don't need these. Sorry for a little break. So at the moment my API 2 is not protected, so again I have to go to control, I have to, I have to say authorize. That's the first thing I have to do. Second thing is that uh, again, exactly like before, bec because I, I use the authorized, I have to, uh, in startup I have to configure my authorization provider, so I will go like in previous step I will go to mm, I will use the same library it's the same principle I use the the same library because I will be using tokens again API 2 doesn't care who is token from as long as it can validate it and uh, yeah exactly like before I will uh, do the startup the same way you know this type the audience is API 2 because I want this to be a different token again I have to configure the authentication and authorization. This m this is machine to machine. There is no course. Because I use the different uh, audience, I have to do the same thing like for API one. I will go to the identity server. I will add uh, the identifier for my API two. And uh, now I need to uh, add my client registration. But the client this type this time is not SPA, but it's an API. So let's another add another client registration. I will explain what's happening here. Uh, this is the client. Uh, this is the new client registration. The client ID I assigned, it's called API1, this is his name, but this type, this time, uh, the allowed grant types is called client credentials because it's machine to machine configuration. And uh, I have to, uh, as an identity provider, I have to generate a secret for the user. Uh, this is in a developer configuration, it's done in this primitive way, which is not obviously safe because you have a secret in your code. You wouldn't do this in a reality, but this is for the demo purposes. So I created um, client credentials for my client, where client ID is API 1 and the secret is secret. And uh, the allowed scopes, what the client uh, API 1 is allowed, he's allowed to ask for the access to API 2. So this is the notion of that. So now I configured the uh, identity provider to be able to s uh, handle the client credentials. I can run it. Next thing, I already protected and configured my API too. And next thing I have to do is I have to go to uh, 
uh, API 1 to the place where I call API 2. This is the original code. You know, in here I just uh, create HTTP client through the HTTP client factory. This is the proper way how you get the HTTP clients. And then I just simply call get on that API 2 and I deserialize the information. And uh, now I have to change this code. I, I want to uh, get the token from the identity provider and use this token in the call. And again, because it's a standard, I can study the protocols and I can uh, implement the step of communicating with identity provider on my own, or I use some library which done it for me. And obviously there is many libraries which can do it for me. Uh, I will use the standard library which is called, um, I forgot, tell you exactly. Oh, it's called the identity model. It's actually a library which is created uh, by the same guys who created identity server, but uh, this NuGet is for your client application. They can use this library to implement the client credentials on the client side. And uh <coughs> then I have to modify uh, using my code here. Uh, this is this is this is uh, yeah basically in my uh, HTTP client code what I have to do I I, I need to get the token and then I have to use this token back so when I when you look into my original method uh, now I, I slightly modify it that uh, before I do the get I set the authorization header and in authorization header I provide a access token and to get the access token you use the library of identity provider and it's done in this way you supply the http client you you get uh, you get the object called discovery document back basically you specify the url of your identity provider and then on uh, on that uh, document discovery you can run different methods and one of the methods you can run on it is getting the access token using the client credentials so in here I tell okay please connect me to this guy this is the identity provider and get access token here are my client ID and client secret and uh, on the way back I will get the access token and I will use the access token in HTTP call so when I run now everything I should be able to see that API 2 is protected now. So you can see this is uh, API 1, it's still protected. This is API 2. Now it's protected as well. I get 401 because I didn't supply token. I will log in. And now uh, one thing I forgot is oh no sorry no no nothing yeah uh, single page application is accessing only API one so it needs only API one scope and it's API two which is sorry it's API one itself which is accessing API two it has nothing to do with the single page application so when I call this uh, second button uh, you remember at the beginning I told you the second button calls API one and API one calls API two so let's see if I get through and you can see now I get through this is the answer from API 1 and this is the answer I got from API 2 so this is the client credentials flows so that's pretty much all for the demos you've seen uh, two main scenarios how to secure a client uh, application which facing the users and how you secure the machine to machine um, when I get the uh, to the last slide, which has only the references. Probably switch to it.
Yeah, these other these other references all you know the, the the sample I the samples I shown you I put into the accessible uh, DevOps Git. Sorry, I have to use the GitHub as everyone, but I didn't get to it yet. <laughs> so in DevOps, but anyway, it's a Git as any other Git, and uh, it has a couple of commits, and the commits. Uh, you would see there is what you have to add in the steps I show in the presentation. So this um, sample has um, like a different commits and you can see what I explain here. Like in first commit I just add the basic baseline solution which didn't have any protection. In the second commit I added the identity server. In third commit I added authentication to single page. So you can see here uh, how to modify the JavaScript application to get the uh, ID token, what you have to do. And in uh, another commit, you can see how uh, you can use the token you get to send it to API and or authorize with API. And the last commit will show you the, sorry, the one before the end will show you the client credentials. That's the scenario we went through now. And uh, the last commit, I knew that there would be no time for it, but it's not important to explain it here. But just if you're interested, I show you at the beginning on the demo sample, the single page application and MVC application. So in the last commit, you can see what you can do to get authentication if you have an MVC application. Again, like you use the, the same authorization code for Pixie flow but you don't want to implement it itself, use the library and everything is you from this commit. So that's pretty much all I wanted to say about I OpenID Connect. Uh, you know, you can like, uh, the big thing about OpenID Connect is that uh, almost everyone is using it now. So typically when you want to access some API and it's some modern company which want to use the modern stuff, they would use the OpenID Connect. We get quite a lot of experience in our project for, uh, you know, Avarda for the Swedish bank. Uh, they use a lot of external providers uh, where we have to authorize. And in, in past, like every provider has some kind of custom authorization protocol, but now they all switching to OpenID Connect and almost all of them are switched to op OpenID Connect as well. So it's important to know you know, because a lot of uh, providers will probably ask you to use this if you want to use them. That's one thing. And another scenario where you use it in our project was, uh, for example, we had, uh, we already learned how to use the OpenID Connect. So when we needed to implement it, some uh, authentication method using some external provider, which didn't use the IP OpenID Connect, what we did was that we included our identity server that identity server did this custom communication with external provider, but for our application it was OpenID Connect. So that's uh, how you can use, for example, the identity server if you want to convert some non-standard protocol to OpenID Connect. That's the identity server good for as well. Uh, I think that's pretty much all. I will send you the, or I will add the presentation to the uh, Slack and you have uh, access to the code, so everything I've shown is uh, can be seen to the code. So if you need to use the OpenID Connect, this is good start. There is much more to it. <laughs> uh, so once you uh, get through it, you can see like slightly different flavors of the stuff I've shown you. For example, for one of the bank, uh, we have to use the encrypted form of the JSON Web Token. Uh, it's quite a special thing, but uh, you can uh, it's uh, in the standard as well. And uh, there is much more stuff. So when you get into these protocols, uh, you might need to learn more stuff, but this is the basic idea of how it works and it can set you, uh, you know, to use it in, in real life. Any questions? The pull request. I've seen a lot of <laughs> I I I actually did my pull request, but it was different Git, and uh, I just uh, you know I just uploaded uh, the Git to the public Git, and you don't get a pull request with that, right? But uh, the the commits uh, 
you know, and the presentation is enough. It's it's not that hard. And uh, you will find a lot of documentation for these libraries. Like Identity Server has very good documentation. And uh, as I said, like uh, sometimes it's uh, it's not easy to use the standard itself, but you can cheat and you can go to third party provider which implements uh, OpenID Connect. You don't have to use the product, but you can use the documentation. And this Okta is one, and another one is called Out2. I think I put it into the link. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, this this Out0, it's another provider which provides identity Open ID Connect as a service. And again, you don't have to use them, but they have very good description how the flow works, and you can just you know, use the documentation to learn from it because it's hard to read the standards. The standards, the specification, they are here. And uh, like yeah, th this link is uh, that's very simple. A uh, couple of pages, introduction into OpenID Connect. Just be careful, like you would still see like a lot of uh, documentation and uh, recommendation for these flows I shown you that they obsolete. Uh, you don't. You should not uh, like uh, the official Open ID Connect. Uh, the recommendation is to use these two flows I shown you, and these are just there for the historical reasons. That's why I didn't even describe them. But obviously, sometimes uh, like not all the identity provider provides this uh, uh, new authorization code with the Pixie. I think, for example, with the Google, I couldn't find it. They they still use the implicit flow. So, you know, you might run into a situation that you cannot use that new one, but you would have to use the old one. 